Humans have a bizarre relationship with time. We tend to be ignorant about the present, romanticize the past, and we're afraid of the unpredictability of the future. That's why so many of us have become lost in routines and get overwhelmed in our daily lives. Because to take an honest look at our past and present with an analytical mind to enter a truly liberating future, well, that would require a quantum leap in our imagination. And in a world that's become so interconnected in so many ways, this kind of rigid thinking has produced two camps of people. Some wake up every morning fully aware of the cries of nature to those who have the power to challenge and liberate the whole of creation from the self-destructive loops of the human condition. And the sun goes down on those who have become lost in the anxiety of the modern world that they are no longer able to prophesy and have visions for they exist entirely in the false glory of their past experiences. And as our world continues to decay, the signs of our current realities and times continue to manifest all around us. It now takes a lot of mental energy to ignore the skies going red over Northern California during a global pandemic, which also exposed the lies that we have allowed the empires of our time to sell us so that the few can continue to have power over the many. As people of faith, we have a rich history of putting ourselves into the apocalyptic narrative of our sacred scriptures. Can we continue to ignore the trumpets of revelation that continue to sound the alarm all around us? Are we even worthy of opening the seals of prophecy that can inspire our young and old to dream dreams once more, so that we may embrace a collective hope towards liberation by placing ourselves in the story of Christ? Suppose these questions stirred the truth inside of your divine self. In that case, we encourage you to ponder on this last question as we expand on our particular ministry context. How can we reconceptualize our ministries so that we may become a voice in the wilderness? One that no longer whispers, but instead screams out into the void of the human heart, collectively awakening the messianic expectations and hope that rejects that world as is by living boldly into the world as it should be. Just over a year ago, everything changed. Like churches all over the country, all over the world. Zion Church here in Norlina was suddenly empty. No children on the playgrounds, no laughter around the tables in the fellowship hall, not even the smell of coffee in the kitchen. Quiet, desolate, a wilderness. For a year, we met in Zoom meetings and on phone calls. We worshiped on Facebook and YouTube. We sheltered at home and, and stayed on lockdown while we watched news stories about racial injustice and state-sponsored violence. While the economy faltered and revealed the cracks in our society, while anxiety and depression took root in the lives of our family and friends. While our neighbors struggled to deal with the losses of their loved ones to COVID-19. This has been a wilderness experience. In Exodus 16, the children of Israel journeyed through the wilderness. They, they came to a place where they despaired. They cried out to the Lord and they lamented that they wished that they'd stayed in Egypt. They longed for the flesh pots and the bread. They, they longed for the certainty of their daily lives in the land of Egypt. Even if that meant that they had to live out their days in bondage. Because their hearts longed to go back, they couldn't see the blessings that God had for them in this new land. I feel that the church is in a similar place now. As we've been emerging from our own desert of uncertainty, of fear, of pain, we have been desperate for reassurance, for stability, for security. We've asked, how long? How long until we can sing again? Until we can eat around the table together again? How long until we can go back 
to normal. But maybe, maybe we're asking the wrong questions. In her book, Forged in Crisis, Nancy Keene talks about how transformational leaders discover a larger purpose. They utilize their gifts to leave a mark in the world. As our church moves to fully reopen after the pandemics, how might we discover a larger purpose than simply returning to the old normal? You know, we have a deep sense of history here, and we know how to narrate that history. But can we draw on the creativity and innovation that we needed to navigate the pandemic in order to envision a better future, to narrate a different possibility for who we might be in the world? Can we envision a way of life where we don't have to choose between virtual worship or in-person Sunday as usual, but we find ways to worship anew? What would it look like for us to have a network of home worship groups and in-person Sundays and online services and small group studies and street corner cafe gatherings? Can we make the boundaries of our 17 acre property permeable so that we no longer see this as our property where we gather? Can we instead see this property as a communal space put here to serve the needs of our neighbors in ways that we may have never imagined before? Can we see ourselves moving out from our buildings and engaging in a hands-on gospel instead of just hearing sermons that we never intend to act on? Who should we seek out as partners as we engage more fully in our community and work toward a promised land for all of us? I believe this is the moment. This is the moment where we must decide whether we will follow God into the future or whether we will return to Egypt and sit down with our flesh pots. Not only are we asking questions about how our ministries might change as we enter into life post pandemic, We also must assess how we have changed. A strategic challenge in my current ministry context is a congregation, Christ followers who are increasingly jaded. They wonder if there's still a place for them in the family of God. They wonder if they even wanna be associated with the people of God. Pre-pandemic, their lives were too busy and they just thought they were tired. Coming out of pandemic, they are beyond tired. The constraints are obvious and heightened and often resemble reluctance. Through the work of Morgan and Barden, I am challenged to find the beauty in these constraints and to work at allowing these constraints of time and energy and and enthusiasm to stimulate a better way of approaching our shared ministry together. Before COVID, the congregation was working towards expanding our ministry with those seeking asylum. And through opportunities unforeseen, a groundswell of interest is building. The congregation now has an opportunity to open a hospitality house in the middle of Central Texas. And as we strategically plan and discern for this ministry, the work of Morgan and Barden can be instructive in acknowledging our constraints and working to allow these constraints to stimulate a new way of envisioning our ministry together here in this community. Additionally, the reality of multiple pandemics exposing the fractures in our society, our church's long-standing commitment to ministering alongside of a sister black church in town has now become front and center. In our jaded reluctance, we may also be sensing a call to hospitality in a very unhospitable society. Pre-COVID, I would not have embarked upon two major extensions of the church's ministry in areas of social justice at the same time. However, we are in a new era. I am challenged to use the tools of improvisation as I watch what is unfolding right before me. In improvisation, the goal is to take what is thrown at you and to say yes and say yes and to what comes at you. So to accept the challenge and then to add to it. 
We are a changed people after COVID, and that change is continuing as we speak. Our congregations are different, and we are just beginning to detect these differences. The discipline of improvisation provides a helpful framework for receiving what is growing in the congregation and pairing it with the needs of our community. As a leader, I'm challenged to guide the congregation on a journey of improvisation, seeking to stay attentive to the work of the Holy Spirit around us. It may just be that in the discipline of saying yes and, that we find our constraint of being reluctant and hesitant, transformed into a beautiful hospitality. This can be the very impetus we need to envision a new way of being God's people in this fractured world. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells a parable and says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Invitations had gone out, but those who were invited had refused to come. Reminders go out about the invitation, and still there are no takers. The invited guests pay no mind to the invitation, preoccupied by other things. More pressing matters, I guess. Still, the banquet is ready. And so the instructions are given by the king to go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So here we are, having been confronted with pandemics. And the question for us, First Baptist Church, is who will we be in a post-pandemic crisis? We enjoy a 209 year rich history, but if we are not to experience the impoverishment of the spiritual food that comes from the banquet of God, we must think slightly differently. Pre-pandemic, we operated within the confines of our denominational perspectives. We invited those of what we thought to be like minds. And yes, we can say as the gospel was proclaimed, we invited all. But did we invite all? Christ is wise to show us that our invitations are not always for everyone, but for selected ones. We are to challenge ourselves to invite anyone we can find. So I envision that means we'll have to think more critically about being more intentional about anyone we can find. That's going to include those that are vaccinated and those that aren't vaccinated. It's going to include those who look like us and those that don't look like us. It's going to include those who are educated and those who are not educated because our invitation must be to anyone we can find. That is what creates a mosaic unity. Peoples from all walks of life with varying contextual faith backgrounds, all must be invited for such is the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is still at hand. Our beautiful constraints around parking can lead us to the street corners of downtown Raleigh, North Carolina and spur us to look for anyone we can find. Our parking does not have to be a constraint, but a beautiful dilemma. And our two worship services can allow us to make great choices to target anyone we can find. The banquet is ready, and at the forefront of our divine work must be our purpose as we respond and reassemble and worship a God who does not change. We must change and realize that it's not so much about the practices that we've held, but more about the invitation that God has allowed us to hold. And as his church, 
we are to present the invitation to anyone we can find. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, bringing the congregation together. And in Miami, Florida, the invitation to anyone we can find alongside a spirit of innovation and hospitality has allowed our ministry called No Reservations to attract folks that have left the church and have become part of the population in the United States that claim no, no religious affiliation. These are the people that although no longer lay with themselves any particular faith tradition, still hold on to many of the spiritual practices and beliefs from their childhood. We also get many people who have been hurt by toxic expressions of our faith and have grown up in non-religious household and have found Christianity all by themselves. Many of the folks who join our group also bring a basic understanding of the Christian faith, a mixture of Sunday school theology alongside the popular social discourses that focus on the worst parts of Christianity. I therefore find myself working with the beautiful constraint of meeting these people where they're at and lovingly nudging them towards a Christianity that places them into the larger story of God. It has been my experience that when an authentic seeker is fully integrated into a faith that stretches back thousands of years, they fully awaken the theological and social reformation that leads to personal transformation that goes beyond the mind and reaches deep into the human soul. One only needs to look at the news headlines today to see that we are living in an unprecedented time in human history. For the first time, the human race can collectively hear the groans of creation as we continue to watch in real time our destructive touch all over the globe. The fate of our planet has become so intricately entangled with humanity that to ignore the wisdom of Genesis that calls us to be caretakers to this world will continue to lead to mass extinctions and to the eventual end of our own modern world. Our limited understanding of the universe today has ensured that humanity, more than any other time in our short history, has a chance to evolve our minds and our souls towards a divinity that exists inside us all. A divinity steeped in prophetic wisdom that has been felt by countless others throughout history. People who have stood in the face of adversity and looked at the realities of the world and dared to imagine one where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing river. People who heard that still speaking voice calling out in the wilderness, telling them to turn towards peace and believe that one day the nations of this world shall bear their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation and they shall practice war no more. And it is this prophetic wisdom that we, in No Reservations, believe is still pulling on the soul of humanity. The pandemics of 2020 have introduced a set of unique challenges to the Christian faith in our country and for billions around the world. In Miami, Florida, No Reservations now seeks to be a spiritual home to those who have become othered by the rigid structures of our faith. A place where anyone can come and explore their questions without any expectations of membership or commitments to any particular way of being Christian. We seek to become a community of spiritual wanderers and misfits, rebels and social justice warriors, and people who simply need time to heal and enter into a state of repose. A spiritual rest that can one day awaken the love of Christ in the depths of their very souls. We want to be a community that does not claim to own any singular theological perspective, nor claims to own truth with a capital T. We simply open our doors to anyone we can find, to those who feel that there is something not right in the world today, and through Christ, inspire them to boldly dare to imagine the world as it should be. And above all, we wish to be a group of reformers who genuinely feel and fully embrace the prophetic wisdom that connects us to 3,000 years of theological insight, so that collectively we may truly become the people of Revelation, bringing about our true potential so that we may spiritually evolve and break free from the self-destructive loops of our fallen nature, inspiring in others the hope that we will live into the fullness of our new Jerusalem, starting with us 
and fruitfully multiplying outwards. It has become clear that we can't move forward as leaders in the same way that we led before the pandemics. We see so much more clearly now the issues that are facing the people of God. Chaos and stress, disillusionment and despair are commonplace. The planet and all that is in it grown bearing the weight of these enormous burdens. We experience it in our local congregations as we examine our church campus, our worship services, our life together, our ministries and engagement with the world. We see it in the lives of those disaffected by the ways the church has failed to meet the challenges of our times. The good news is that the church was made for this. It is not the first time that turbulence has hit the church and challenged the people of God to respond with life-giving love and innovation of Christ, a church where all are truly welcomed and hope flows freely with no reservations. This is our time and our calling. In the book of Esther, Mordecai exhorts his young niece to step up and to lead boldly during a dangerous time, saying, For if you keep silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. She needed enormous courage to cast a vision for her people, and the costs could not have been any more high or more dramatic. And in many ways, the people of God are in a similar place, and we, like Mordecai, get to lead the church to accept this calling. The stakes are high, and the needs are great, and yet we have what the world needs most. May we face the challenges of ministry in a post-COVID world and receive them with an improvisational mind, one that says yes and, training ourselves to ask the best questions and to use integrative thinking while transforming our constraints to stimulate newness. It will take courage, vision, and leadership, but this is why we are here. For such a time as this, so that the world that sits in darkness may join the chorus recited at Purim, saying, Blessed are you, my Lord, our God, our Sovereign of the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this season. So say we all. Amen.